Hi, everyone. My name is Ethan. I'm the CEO and co-founder of TextQL, and we build agents uh, for really, really, really big data. This presentation is called Building AI That Can Query 100,000 Tables with Petabytes of Data and Zero Configuration, because uh, I, I was told that being very specific uh, generally helps to make people understand what you actually do. And so what do we actually do? Historically, there are kind of like two types of like AI for data that everyone's kind of heard of, right? There's like a, there's like the classic like historical infrastructure for like really big data. This is data like that can't fit on your computer. We're talking about roughly at around like 16 gigs is when like your computer would shut down if you tried to do really big manipulation on that. And so you need very specialized systems, uh, Oracle, like ERP, CRMs, HRIS systems, data warehouses, big like, you know, uh, BI tools. All these things have very, very high configuration costs. You have to like migrate, and like when they offer an you an AI product, that only works for the data within their environments. And then there's the other class of uh, data products and AI products that everyone's probably played with today here, uh, which are you know Claude, ChatGPT, Notion, Glean. These are platforms that like do really well with PowerPoints and presentations and uh, and spreadsheets and PDFs and uh, Word docs that fit on your computer, and uh, do not let you really access data that is petabytes because there's a lot of work that goes into that. And so that's what we try to do. We try to make it possible to deploy AI that you can ask questions like, uh, can you connect my CRM data to my Snowflake data to like all the emails that I sent last week and tell me like which of my customers are most likely to churn? Or can you validate that all these numbers are correct? And then you know even commit like a PR to GitHub to make sure that the, uh, the, the SQL migrations that we're doing are all like correct. Um, so it's a very, very hard amount of overhead. We work with like very big companies. Uh, we work with like very uh, compliant like environments. We deploy into like hospitals, financial services. Is a super on-prem like in, in for a heavy like environment, and we work with some of the largest uh, AI labs because uh, that that's really literally how hard it is to build out all this infrastructure. More use cases: we do financial services and healthcare like predominantly, and all, and we do a lot of like transformations um, around uh, making sure people can build pipelines, move data around, really like work with big data, for lack of a better word. You might be thinking, why do I care about this? Well, right now, if the unit cost of like you doing like a data request and asking like, hey, can you like you know figure out what the most likely customer to churn is? Uh, if that costs you a month of time of a Stanford PhD in data science that you pay $300,000 a year to, that sets a kind of a floor on how valuable the opportunity has to be for you to analyze that. Obviously, if you can bring down the cost of that analysis, you can train an agent to do that for one tenth, one hundredth, one one thousandth of the cost. Um, it unlocks a lot more opportunities, right? It lets you like take analysis that you're doing today at like the like you're trying to figure out like which of our customers are going to churn per month per state, and you want to do that analysis really like per city per week per uh, per zip code per day uh, really like per per LinkedIn post from your champion at a particular account who is leaving and says I am very sad and you read from that that they were fired and therefore all their initiatives are going to shut down and you want to like anticipate that in advance or something that's like a very very low latency thing that's very hard it's very expensive that's kind of what we do so to walk you through an example uh, let's say uh, there's a finance guy on your team uh, Dylan who is uh, in the audience here with us today who uh, we have to do some board reporting. It's five minutes until the board meeting, and he sends me this uh, thing, and he says, uh, can you look at this like thing, uh, spreadsheet, there's an image on it. I have no idea where these numbers came from. Can you double check that these are correct? And I don't happen to have a Stanford PhD that I can like accelerate uh, a month of work into two, 20 minutes for. So this is actually the, uh, this is like slightly like, this is our real like prod data. Uh, this is on top of a data warehouse of, I think about like 10,000-ish tables. Uh, it worked the first time with no configuration. Now it's kind of cached, so it won't be as sexy. Um, so if I take this and I go to, I need a prepare -a meeting, and I go, uh, hey, Anna, can you double check if this is true? Uh, Matt told me this is correct. Uh, the, the Matt on my team. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm going to be really mad if it's not correct because the board is going to fire me. Um, uh, tell me if they will be happy or not, and if not, um, what I can do about it to drive the usage to go up. I used to run a data team uh, at a startup. Uh, we had like 10 people. I was responsible for every single one of these requests. If I got, if I got a request like this, I would want to gouge my eyes out because uh, there's no context. There is an image. I have no idea what table this came from. There's no lineage. There's no infrastructure. There's no metadata documentation whatsoever. Uh, I have no idea what table they pulled it from. I don't know if it was like segment logs or Snowflake or something else. But uh, you'll see Anna start to reply and start telling me the work that she is doing. Uh, so if I go into the environment, what you'll see is a uh, You'll see the uh, agent has received this. Um, I can, you know, ask follow-up questions. And it'll like w once it's done replying, it'll like generate a report, send it back to Slack. And uh, I actually didn't think this far ahead because if I had, I would have realized now we're going to stare at this run for a little bit. Maybe to like walk through like how we managed to do this and like the kind of things that it's happening under the hood. Um, how can I like do this over hundreds of thousands of tables without knowing anything about your data warehouse? Well. The first thing it does is uh, it looks at a 
context repository that we maintain. Uh, that's actually um, a GitHub uh, context uh, repo that we like let it like write PRs to. And this way, it kind of has this like memory concept um, that is like, you can scale this to infinite amounts. It'll just run like 50, uh, if anyone's an engineer here, like greps uh, against the thing to try to find like all the like keywords that you're looking for um, without using vectors. There's no vectors. It's entirely like syntactically oriented. So it can like, you know, be very like messy in its approach to finding its content. Um, and like it has a ton of like, you know, infinitely complex calculations or anything else like built into it. Example queries, all the cache stuff. And at the end of any session, you can tell the agent, just save this to your context, make sure it's always there and it'll write a PR and uh, you can merge that and uh, you will kind of just, it'll just keep getting smarter. Now, when it gets into the SQL mode, uh, this is kind of the thing that we really do very differently from every other company in the world uh, who claims to have something like this, which is we don't try to one-shot the SQL. What that means is we don't try to write SQL, hit run, and like make sure the query is perfectly correct. Because anybody who in the room has, who has ever written SQL before knows that if I give you 10,000 pages of documentation and a SQL terminal, and I tell you, hey, can you help me figure out which of our customers are going to churn, uh, and you can only hit the run button once, you're going to get the wrong answer. It is like literally impossible. It is not how you go about generating SQL. And so for us, we have the agent Explore the database. It, it, it's looking at the information schema. For anyone who doesn't isn't SQL literate, what this means is it is literally saying, "Tell me every table, table you have, um, and then tell me every column you have, um, and then like it's going to scan through the whole thing, and then like anything that's not relevant is going to dump out of context, um, and so we can like run for an incredibly long amount of time as it like tries to, tries to step through uh, all of this stuff. Now, um, I guess while it's running this, yeah, it, it's like like pulling the it's pulling the data, it's forming hypotheses. It might like look at a daytime field like. Data warehouses are incredibly messed up environments. Every enterprise has like 50 of them. Every enterprise has another 30 different BI tools from like the past like 35 years. Um, three different ERPs, 17 different CRMs. And so there's a lot of like hypotheses testing that like the agent steps through as it's exploring. It has to like go, oh, like plot the daytime columns. Oh, cool. Uh, there's a drop here. There's a data pipeline that was probably broken. Um, so it's a lot of it's a lot of like hypotheses testing so it can like recover from all of the things and all the pieces. Um, I think it's uh, written some like uh, you know written some plots, written some visualizations. Uh, eventually, it, now it's like referencing our CRM, uh, and so it can directly plug into any other data sources that you have uh, that is very fast to configure. Because well, it's making an API call the exact same way that any one's thing can make an API call. Um, and yeah, while it's doing all this, I can show you uh, what happens after I complete this which is um, I would take like a completed playbook or like a report or something, like for example, this daily customer upsell analysis that tells me which customer I should reach out to and ask them for more money. Uh, and once I know that you know, it steps through like 50 steps and it'll give me a good result, I can schedule this to run every day, every week, every time a customer sends me an email um, to give me a new report like this, right? This is how you um, kind of go from like the uh, ask questions and it'll tell you what is this number to eventually ask questions and it'll tell you why did this number go up and eventually uh, ask questions why did this go up okay given why it, that you know why it went up tell me what I can do to make the number go up or down depending on if it's a good number or a bad number and that's like a very very useful thing because once you do that you make way more money having the thing uh, I guess like you know run on a loop and like just find you more money okay it's done so it's finished the final report it came back there's like a whole thing it says uh, you know the uh, the, the expected stuff is all correct. There's a like 3% delta, I think, because we changed the way we count something. Um, and also the August number was like way off because uh, this this like thing was like presented to me in August. If you read the text, it says, you know, chart displayed August to date uh, for August uh, represented approximately August 13th, uh, which is probably correct if I go back and check when he sent me this. Uh, to, or I, I'm gonna assume it's correct because there's no reason for it to not be correct. Um, and then it'll tell me like, uh, actually, okay, fine, fine, fine. I'll check, I'll double check that Matt, uh, Matt, Matt actually sent me this at that time. This is uh, August 14th. It's, it, we're, we're off by a date. It said approximately 13, it's actually 14. Um, and, the, uh, and, the, and the thing comes out to uh, revenue growth, ACU usage, uh, something, something corresponds to the thing uh, we should tell. Matt's data is partially correct and complete, uh, likely working with mid-month data, exceptional performance, celebration worthy data, something, something, this is great. I'm not gonna get fired. Uh, and uh, now I'm really happy. And yeah, the, that's approximately uh, the demo. Uh, like we, uh, for people who like want to, are curious about how deeper, how much deeper we go, like there's a lot of infrastructure that we had to build out to make this possible. We've like rebuilt this product for the first two and a half years of this company. We rebuilt this product seven times over, right? We tried like 
catalogs, fine tuning, SQL terminals, vector stores, um, like like catalogs with vector stores and sandboxes and SQL stores and all these things. Like we added like DuckDB, we added Polars, we added um, like we started with a sandbox so we could execute and we're as, as I've been recently reminded, uh, we're the first company to publicly release a version of Code Interpreter uh, that wasn't in beta, and uh, and then we were like, oh, the data is getting really big. Okay, well, we need something that's not just pandas in Python, it's gonna be polars. Then we were like, okay, the data got even bigger. Okay, we need like DuckDB, got even bigger. Passed down to the data warehouse, got even bigger, and we need to join on the fly, serverless clickhouse infrastructure. Then we had to roll a semantic layer for, because some people wanted deterministic queries to come out every time. Then some of those queries took a really long time, so we added caching and acceleration. And then some people had Tableau and Looker and Power BI and all those things, so we had to build our own MCP servers for all those platforms uh, because uh, Databricks and Snowflake and Tableau's MCP servers are mo moderately, maybe not the most usable things in the world. In summary, uh, if you if you want to roll this yourself at your own company, uh, a company like Ramp or with exceptional engineers or something, you should do that. Uh, this is totally doable now with today's technology and GPT-5. All you have to do is build your own uh, compute format, uh, table format uh, that is natively integrated with your compute format that can do this across multiple different large data sources, build your own MCP servers for the Tableau's 17 different ways of ingesting data, Four out of four of them break. We actually found like a roundabout way to actually get this to work. So much so that the, even the Tableau team currently tags us into accounts to try to, uh, I guess like, to figure out their AI things for customers who want to use Tableau AI but can't get it to work. We rolled our own semantic layer. It's compilable, transpilable from like all existing semantic layers, um, like LookML, Cube, Metricflow, and, uh, and, and, and like a really cool like GUI that looks kind of wild when you put in over a thousand objects onto the same thing. Uh, at the same time, and uh, and our own agent builder, which you know, this is like very different from like because we're running like a more non-deterministic agent, uh, like uh, like Cloud Code modality wise, it looks very very different. Like the right UI builder for something that's going to be less if else statements and more use best judgment and run for like two hours or ten hours as like test time compute like kicks in for like the latest like generation of models. You generally want like more logic on the trigger way more uh, instructions on the prompt environment, and then like an easier iteration cycle for testing, because you're gonna be running these models for like hours and hours. Now this is not the best UI in the world, but um, generally pretty bearish on, um, I guess like the canvas space like UI for like uh, agent building. We rolled our own, I guess we, we have a semantic layer, which means we need tools to query the semantic layer. We rolled our own version of, um, we, we took like lookers, like metric explorer and like palantir's object explorer and combined them onto something that works on the same surface area, because sometimes business users wanna ask, get me all the blanks, like customers or something, with all these attributes. And that's like an object question because every row is a noun. And sometimes people ask, show me how X, Y, and Z metrics change over time and uh, break it out by 17 different objects that come from 35 different tables. And that's gonna be also a horrible thing, but that's a totally different type of math um, to get correct. I know a lot of people in the world offer the uh, offer like AI for SQL, AI for big data, AI for data warehouses. We work with a lot of customers who've been, you know, two and a half years in on building semantic models for Snowflake, and they can get it to work for exactly 20 tables. Um, and you know, we can for anyone here who cares about asking questions of their data and getting decision intelligence and all that stuff and building AI that can work with really big data. Like if I can't make sense, if our agent can't make sense of your data warehouse with you know over 100,000 tables even um, in any data environment with no configuration time and it can't build its own semantic model and like do all the data integration for itself in the same loop and like do all the PRs and change your DBTs and everything else required to like get it to a place where it can analyze all your data, I will buy your entire whole team, data team, uh, Nobu, with our VC dollars. Uh, we've made this offer I think like 20 times, uh, nobody's taken up, up on it, and uh, maybe one day uh, we will come across a horrible, horrible, I'm guessing it's probably gonna be like a manufacturing company with like IoT devices, um, like with like infinite like joint complexity. Uh, but uh, until then, uh, yeah, uh, I'd love to, you know, some thank, thank you for watching. <laughs>